the last time we were here, we concluded our meeting with a statement from Carl Jung. I don't know how many people are familiar with his work, but he was um, probably the most brilliant psychoanalyst along with uh, Sigmund Freud from the early 1900s. In fact, he was you know, somebody who worked with Sigmund Freud. Uh, uh, Carl Jung, uh, he did take drugs. And one of the reasons they asked him, I said, why do you do this? And he said, how am I ever going to know what these people are referring to unless I can see it myself? And he did. Um, but he was brilliant. He's written many, many books. And uh, he said something that was quoted, and, and we looked at it last week, and, and, it, and it touched me, and I want to share it with you. It's Carl Jung. He said, the principal product of religion is guilt and despair. Despair over this life, despair over our thoughts, despair over our desires, despair over our actions. And as we dwell on this despair, we drive ourselves into repression in an effort to control our own thoughts and desires. And this repression leads to depression, which fosters disease. <laughs> And you, 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 many people in, in the main line, uh, you know, would never admit uh, how correct that is, and yet it's true. People spend their whole lives trying not to let anybody else know what they're doing or where they're going or what they're thinking or what they're watching, you know. And, and, and we're, you know, everybody hiding out from everybody else. And, and Carl Jung's comments are not about the Bible, they're not about God, they're not about reality, they're about religion, which is a structure built upon the desires of some people to control the beliefs of others. And, and that's the problem. In a group or organization that mandates that you think the way they do, and if you don't, then you somehow have to subvert the way you think. These controllers, as I would call them, they set up living standards based on how they interpret writings that are thousands of years old and that contain legends, traditions, mythology, and they take those things and say, this is what it means and you must believe it. And they oversee organizations and they drive into the minds of their members the fear that if they don't obey their instructions, they will eventually fall into a fiery hell dominated by demons chasing you with pitchfork. I remember, I don't know, one time we were down in our other building and I was setting up and somebody that we had known, I can't even remember, came in and was trying to talk me out of this philosophy. And he brought somebody with him to pray. And this guy was mumbling, well, and he had the Bible, blah, 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 whatever he was saying. And he was like praying protection that the demons around me were not going to, you know, grab him and throw him up. In the... But it's, it's bizarre. And it's strange. But the most important thing is, it is extremely destructive to the human mind that people have to live under such fear and guilt. And that's what happens. And, and it's not just here. I mean, it's all over. Whether it be in the East, or whether it be in the Muslim places, the Jew, Israel places, whatever. Everybody's afraid to look a certain way or do something for fear that, you know, they'll offend the group. So they show up on Sunday. They do, faithfully, and they play their part. Even put a suit and a tie on. You know, have a tie. They show up and how do you do, Pastor? I and they and then they can't wait to get out of there. How long is this going to go on? <laughs> because inside, and you know what? There are even people who sit while the preacher or the priest is saying things, and they're playing movies in their head. And some of them are pretty good. So all one has to do is evaluate religion 
by going back to the Dark Ages of Europe. What happened in the Dark Ages was what many in the Christian right-wing movement that we hear about in politics would like to see happen now. And that is that Christianity became the government. The only time, really, in the West that Christianity became the government, it's labeled the Dark Ages. Intellectuals and scientists were killed or banished. People like Galileo and Copernicus, they became a threat to religion because they told the truth about nature. People were tortured to death in the Inquisition and women who were spiritual were called witches and were killed. I, that's what happens when religion becomes the government. It was a horrible time, but it laid the foundation of how all religion survives, and not just Christianity. And how does it survive? Just by, as Carl Jung says, causing people to live in fear. In the Dark Ages, they lived in fear of the religious government, and that still exists in different parts of the world. In this country, uh, that type of fear has is, is started to rise up, but mainly the religions control their followers by what? One word. There is one word that stands out, that scares people, and in fact, you use it, you tell people to go there, and it's called... Oh, whoa, it scares you. It really does. See, and the concept is if you don't be good and if you don't behave the way we say, that's where you're going to go. Okay. Right out of the dark ages. But you know what? It still works today. There was a president that many of you... Some of you might be old enough to remember. I read about him. <laughs> His name was Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And he was a brilliant orator. If you ever heard him, and uh, next to our current president, you wouldn't believe that such a thing could happen. <laughs> Franklin Roosevelt in the 40s made a statement, and you know what he said? We have nothing to fear but fear itself. Boy, and that's exactly what Carl Jung was saying. But that's what religion is all about. You must live not in constant love, not in relaxation, not in communication with nature and others and having fun and laughing and enjoying yourself and going to the shows, and you can't do that. They go, some of them, on a Wednesday night to a basement of some building and read and have ziti. They always have ziti. But all of this nonsense comes from a total misrepresentation of the Bible as a literary book when, in fact, it is not a literary book but a book of Greek mythology. If people understood the Bible and really read it. You know what they would find out about hell? That's not a place where you go after you die. It's a place you go while you're alive, right here on planet Earth. And many people live there all the time. Let me show you. Now, here are some uh, scriptures from the Bible which will give us a different look at Proverbs. The way of life is above to the wise that he may depart from the hell beneath. Aha, uh -huh, you see? Above, as we raise ourselves above, we depart from that which is the lower. So in other words, the higher mind, the higher thoughts, free us from the fear of the lower. So you've always been taught that once you go to hell, they chase you with the pitchforks around and all this stuff. And you never get out of there. But that's not what even the Bible says. They made that up to scare people. Okay? What's the next one? Second Samuel. The sorrows of hell surround me. This guy's alive. See? In other words, ay, 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 already. This I can't deal. All right, what? What is this? Why should I have to think of this? Ay, ay, ay. Now, what's the next one? Say? 
Psalms. For great is your mercy toward me. You took my soul from the lowest hell. Say that He, You know, you could think of, of tragedies that people have experienced. I mean, think of the people in Iraq. We have created a hell. But terrible. Let's see what the next one says. I cried to the Lord because of my trouble, and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell I cried, and you heard my voice. So you see what I'm saying? These are all biblical scriptures. That says that's not what you're taught. Hell is some place that people go to after they die. That's not true. It's a place that you occupy when you're alive. And you can leave there. The way of life is above to the wise, which means that when you dwell in your meditation in the higher realms of the mind, you depart from the hell of the lower material mind. So hell is a concept of the mind, as all things are concepts of the mind. It is the concepts of the mind that create the material reality of the physical world. See, everything, you're sitting on chairs in this room. At one time, that chair was in somebody's mind. It didn't even exist. And he threw a picture in his mind, and, then he, and then there it is. Everything is created out of the mind. As I said, the thoughts of people... Look at, look at what the thoughts of the people who flew the planes into the World Trade Center. They created a hell. But at one point, it was nothing more than a thought. And so then we come along and drop bombs on innocent people over there in Iraq. We create a hell. And so it all comes out of people sitting and thinking, I think this is a good idea. So what does it mean? Our kindness can bring heaven. Or our violence and cruelness can bring hell. But here's an interesting thing. Where did the word and the concept come from? Remember, the word hell is an English word. It's a translation from the Greek. Now I'm going to tell you something amazing. In the entire Bible, both the Old Testament and the New Testament, the word hell doesn't exist. It's not in there. What is in there is a word that the English translators translated out of the Greek and the Hebrew. So in other words, this word was concocted by English translators. There are two words in the Bible that reference the subject of the lower mind. And the two words are Sheol, which is Hebrew, and Gehenna, which is Greek. Those are the two words. Okay? You can translate them any way you want once you find out what they mean. But our English creators translated them to mean hell. Okay? So, um, let's take a look at, at, at those two words, Sheol. Let's take a look at this, Sheol. Sheol, in Hebrew, is the abode of the dead. Okay? The underworld. The common grave of humankind. The common destination of both the righteous and the unrighteous, as recounted in Ecclesiastes. Sometimes compared to Hades and Scriptures and New Testament, blah, blah, blah. So it's a place, they thought, where people go. Because nobody knows, where do they go? I don't know. They went to Sheol. Why not? So how did that become the place with things ch chasing you with pitchforks and fires? See, that's the word. And it not, has nothing to do with all of this terrible stuff that we English people made up. A common destination for both good people and bad people. Now, when the second century in, in Jewish thought came along in the Torah, there was a change. The second century Jews who accepted the oral Torah 
had come to believe that those in Sheol awaited the resurrection either in comfort, in the bosom of Abraham, or in torment. This belief reflected in Jesus' story of Lazarus. At that time, the Jews who rejected the oral Torah meant that Sheol was simply a grave. So what does this mean? Who knows? It's all, I think it means this. No, I think it means that. No, I think it means... Who knows? See? There, there, yeah, there are words in a book. And so, it depends what group you belong to as to what you think it might mean. Okay? So then, it's either a resting place a place of comfort or torment or simply the grave. No one knows. But it's not the fiery hell that we've been fighting. That is what the Jewish word we translated into hell. Now let's take a look at the Greek word Gehenna. Gehenna, late Latin from the Greek Gina, from the Hebrew Hinnon. I want you to look at this very carefully. See this word Hinnon? That's where the word Gehenna came from. Okay? A place or state of misery, and look what else was introduced. Hell. That's where the English. So, Hinnon, it comes from the word Hinnon. The Greek interpretation of the older Jewish writings at Alexandria, Egypt, incorporated Greek mythology. We've gone over and over. Now the Greeks arrived at the word Gina, a translation of the Hebrew word Hinnon. In Israel, there was a literal valley of Hinnon. Okay? <laughs> the amazing thing uh, is that's where the word hell came from. I'm going to show you how this turned into, how Hinnon turned into Gehenna, turned into a place of hell and fire and all this stuff. Here's a picture of the Valley of Hinnon. Uh, well, uh, Gehenna is derived from Hinnon. Hinnon is also the meaning the valley. The valley is outside the wall of ancient Jerusalem. Are you ready for this? Hinnon is the garbage dump where they burn the garbage. So in other words, the church decided these people are garbage and they're going to go to hell, which is the garbage dump outside. It's like taking it up to where uh, these people dump it up in uh, I don't even know where they dump garbage. But that's what it is. It's a garbage dump. The word hell has its roots in the word Hennen, Hennen, which is a garbage dump outside of Jerusalem where they burn the garbage. And that's where it came from. Now that word that religion has used to scare the hell out of people for hundreds and hundreds of years is a garbage dump where the garbage was burnt. And there you see, here is your very first picture of hell. You've never seen it before. There. No problem. Nothing to be afraid of. But where the hell did the word hell come from? It's not in the Bible. It's not Sheol, it's not Gehenna, it's this word hell. It's scared so many people, but here's, here, here, here it is. This is, this is uh, amazing. The word hell is Norwegian. What Norwegian? Norwegian. The English word hell has been theorized as being derived from the Old Norse H-E-L. Amongst other sources, the Poetic Edda, compiled from earlier traditional sources in the 13th century, and blah, 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 provide information regarding the beliefs of the Norse pagans, including a female named Hal. Can you see the husband with the missus? Oh, you're never friendly anymore. Oh, go to hell that might have had a real physical meaning. You see what I'm saying to you? A female named Hell who is described as ruling over an underworld. Okay. So all of this bizarre stuff winds up 
being an extremely bizarre construction of religious people who are trying to scare people. Can you imagine? The word is from Norway and it's talking about a young lady. One would suppose that the person who translated the Bible in England, translated Gehenna in English, probably had some relatives in Norway. And let's call it hell. But the word as constructed by religion means a fiery place where demons are and all that stuff. And A word about a Norwegian woman who ruled over a mythical place in the underworld. So my, word, my, my reason for all this is to try to get you to see, don't live in this fear that people put. It's not true. It is not even remotely true. Not a bit. But it's just how some people have perverted the words of the Bible in order to frighten and control people. The word hell is not in the Bible. The word Sheol and Gehenna are in the Bible. They mean an underworld place. They don't mean a fiery place. And the word hell is the name of a lady from Norway. Gehenna is the word of the Greek mythology that describes the mental pit that one falls in. We've all been there. We've all been there at one time or another. We've all been there where we've been scared or frightened. I lived my whole life as a child in that type of a situation. But the large religions have used it to confuse with fear. So I want you to do is the next time you hear somebody threaten somebody with the word hell, I want you to think of this. There she is. A little lady from doorway with her Norwegian gown on. That's hell. Kind of gives a new meaning to the phrase of going to hell, doesn't it? <laughs> How silly are people that we allow superstition. And do you know what's so bad about it? That this deliberate attempt to manipulate these words, to frighten and control. How many, how many children have been scared to death as, as children uh, over this stuff that doesn't exist? Superstitions from long ago to sell us such stuff has such a fearful effect, as Carl Jung said. Hmm. I want to talk to you for a, a minute about baptism. And, and uh, we've talked about it before, but I wanted to, to just share something with you. <laughs> I'll tell you why in a minute. But I've tried to provide reasonable information. Everybody gets baptized. Everybody. I mean, there's not a person who has been executed in the penitentiaries for doing terrible things that hasn't been baptized. They've all been baptized. But what is the true biblical meaning of it? And, and, I'm, and I'm not trying to, uh, I'm just trying to be real. And I'm trying to move in the direction that Carl Jung was talking about and saying, my goodness gracious, stop making people fearful and stop, you know, getting people all consumed in things that are silly when there's so many wonderful, beautiful things in nature to be part of, okay? So let's look at some common sense at what this supreme light, this supreme intelligence would require of our senses living on the planet Earth. Let's think of the possibility of a plan designed by this cosmic intelligence that we call God as it relates to baptism. God's plan and the importance of baptism. Okay, It is important that people are dunked in water to give them a symbol of being cleansed of their sins. Okay, what's the next one? It is important that people are renewed in their minds that they may live in harmony on earth with nature and one another. Is it hot in here? I'm turning that down to 50. I'll show you Florida people. Now, wait, I, you don't have to show your hands because I don't want you to reveal your innermost thoughts. What do you think is more reasonable? 
Is it more reasonable that we dunk people in water? Because they do that at the amusement park. You can throw the thing at a guy. Do we dunk people in water? Or would it be better if we change their minds so that they would live in harmony with nature and with one another? Which one do you think would be more important? Obviously. There's one person in the back said he thought dunking in water was... So there's your choice. And you, you, uh, it's better to wet people with water or is it better that their minds are changed so they can live properly? People have been baptized in water for 2,000 years. And just think back now. What has it done to bring harmony and peace to the earth? What has it, been, what has it done to bring harmony and peace to the mind? Now I'm going to show you a broad hint in the Bible that baptism is a symbol. It is portrayed in mythology as dunking someone in water, but it means something else. This is the directions from the Bible about baptism. All right? Now watch this. Hebrews 6 1. Leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ. There's, there's one I bet you've never heard anybody in your church talk about. In other words, what this writer of the Bible is saying, you know the stuff that Jesus said? Forget that. Let us go on to perfection. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and faith or the doctrines of baptism, laying on our hands, resurrection, and all this kind of stuff. And this we will do. In other words, forget all of this stuff and go on to perfection. Leaving the principles of, let us go, not laying again the foundation of the doctrine of baptism. Leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ. See, what is happening is that people for years and years and years that get dunked in water are responding to the principle instead of the reality. What is the reality? It lies in perfection. That's exactly what the Bible says. And what is perfection where there is no thought whatsoever? We had, I, I'm just saying, we had a situation here Tuesday night. And uh, it doesn't happen that often, but it did happen. Uh, I think Cleo brought in a, a DVD of Mozart. And in the meditation, we played Mozart. And I was back talking with the group in the back. And I said, and, and this, the entire half hour that I sat in meditation, all I saw going through my mind was myself as a child, riding a bicycle, waiting for the good humor man, running through the backyards, being on the roof of a garage, and, you know, all this stuff, everything, walking out of the library, everything as a kid. And so I said, would it be something if at our present age we could go back and meet ourselves when we were 10 or 11 years old. And just sit down and have a conversation. Because you know? we're two different people. And Al Vero was standing there and he said, you know, it's funny you said that. I said, why? He said, because I sat here and my meditation was a kaleidoscope of going all through different things when I was a little kid. Going in backyards and doing all this stuff. And we looked at each other because he didn't know, I didn't know, yet we were the same thing. So I asked a few people, and then I asked Mary, and, and Mary told about, you know, when she, in her meditation, was her childlike response to and her and Joan have it. I said, there's something, something happened as a result of this Mozart effect. But it was, but it was, it was amazing. It was one of the first documentation that I've ever had of the power of this meditation and the electrical significance of it because here's two people sitting in the dark and at the exact same time unknowns to each other their minds are you know racing through the streets of, and the backyards of their youth and, and, and so some people say and I think this is where we make a mistake some people say well you're thinking no 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 I wasn't thinking at all it was coming you know what I'm saying? I wasn't sitting here. If I'm thinking, I'm thinking, oh, let's see now. I've got to get this work done, and I've got to get that done. Uh, I wonder what so-and-so's doing. I'm not nothing. 
this and that was just pouring in. I saw myself, the good humor man. I, I used to stand there with my seven cents, you know, and here he comes, ling, 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 ling. One day, he came down the street, and I, I was out there. My father, who, who, who was a, 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 drank a lot of alcohol, and he came out, and, and the good human man's name was Bill. And he invited Bill in for a little refreshment because it was a hot day. Well, my father and Bill really went over the edge. And Bill winds up going out and unloading the good humor truck and bringing it all and putting it on the kitchen table. And it was melting all over the place. As a child, one of the fond memories I have is the good humor truck weaving up Tremont Avenue with the doors open and flapping. Whatever happened to the poor guy, I don't know. That's true. So, perfection. And, and looking at English words translated from the Greek, and there are two important words here. One is principles, and the other is doctrine. That, that's, that's leaving the principles of the doctrines of Christ. So we're being told by the Bible, regardless of what any preacher or pastor or father says, we're being told, go away from the principles of the doctrines of Christ, and we are told one of the doctrines whose principles we must leave is baptism. Now remember, this is the Bible telling you what to do, not me. It's telling you, get away from the principle of the doctrine of baptism. So, let us look at the definition here. Come on. That's the only way you ever can come to grips with understanding this stuff. Principle. A comprehensive and fundamental law, doctrine, or assumption. Okay? <laughs> now, let's look at doctrine. Doctrine, a teaching, an instruction, something that is taught, a principle or position. So what do we have here? The principle is a fundamental law and the doctrine is a teaching. We have a code of conduct here and we have the teaching about it here and here we have the Bible saying, get away from that. So we're told to set aside the conduct of baptism contained in the teaching of Christ for a reason to go on to perfection. Well, the church has never done that. You know, they... they do you know why I'm going through... Let me tell you something. There was a story that came out in the news that a guy was being baptized and drowned. Oh, no. Now it comes in a different news. They're saying that well, he was swimming around where they were baptizing, and he drowned. I'm not too sure. He might have been swimming waiting for his turn. But he... Here's a guy who came down looking to get new life. And they dragged him out by his feet. He's dead. He drowned. Baptism in most cases now, mandates either sprinkling or submerging the person. Okay? I'll show you where the idea comes from. There it is. You see all the various ways. Here they're sprinkling, dipping, going to put them in the pool. This kid is having a, a terrible time. <laughs> I'm just going to put him. Oh, yeah, yeah. And here are people lined up and, uh, you know, they're gonna, in the water. Okay, so here is where this comes from. This is the Greek, which your Bible is written in. And the Greek established four principles. Earth, water, air, fire, and the good mind in God. The good mind. These were the five levels of the mind in Greek. And they wrote the Bible. Earth, water, air, fire, so what happens? We take our body, which is physical, put it in the water, 
come up into the water, out of the water, into the air, and are touched by the fire of the Spirit. That's the basis of this. Taken literally. But that's not what the Greeks intended. This was of the mind. It's not a physical bodily thing. It's of the mind. Your mind. In other words, you take your head and you go into meditation. And then, as you rise up, it goes into these different particles described as water. And then you go at a higher meditation into the air. And then you go at the higher meditation where you're touched by what they call fire. It's stages of meditation. That's the real baptism. It's a matter of meditation. The meditative mind in Greek is broken down into these five sections. I don't know why I've got it twice, but I think I got it twice. No, okay. Here's where it came from. Aristotle. People are being baptized in water all over the world. Why? Because the priest said it? No. Because the minister said it? No. Because Aristotle said it. Aristotle, practical as ever, in his determination to get things worked out in detail, proposes a new theory to explain how the four elements of Empedocles and the atoms of Democritus produce the wide range of substances apprehended by our sen uh, senses. And he says, he suggests that there are two pairs of alternatives, hot and cold, moist and dry, which provide the exact nature of matter. In broad terms, the four combinations are the four elements, earth, cold and dry, air, hot and moist, fire, hot and dry, water, cold and moist. But it is the infinitely variable balance between these qualities which creates the different atoms of stone, wood, bone, or flesh. So here is Aristotle and Empedocles and Democrates setting down the four elements of earth, water, air, fire, and they turn into being concepts of the mind because all things that exist also exist in the mind. See? In meditation, moving the earth which is the physical body, into that second range, which is water, then up into the air to be touched by fire is the fourth. That results in the transformation of the mind. So here are people who are baptized this way, and their mind is renewed, they become enlightened, and they begin to harmonize with nature and the animals and the earth and with one another. Otherwise, even though you get your head wet, even though you get your whole body wet, you're not changing what they call the carnal mind. The carnal mind is the physical mind, which we shut down in meditation to go to perfection. See? And this is why. See, you can pray, or you can sing, God is good, God is good. Or you can read the Bible, or said in Job, and you can do all of that stuff. But you're not shutting off the carnal mind. And why is that so important? Look what the Bible says. Romans 8, 7. This is supposed to be Paul, whoever knows. Because the carnal mind is enmity, that means it's hostile against God, it is not subject to the law of God, neither can it be. So it doesn't make any difference. What you do, you can't do it. No matter what church you go to, how... I mean, for God's sake... Because there's a mouse in a church, there's a church. The mouse lives in the church. That doesn't make the mouse holy. And so there's the point. No matter what you do, that's what baptism is all about. But we rejected the real meaning, and we cling to the superstition that there is a man in the sky who gets all excited when you get wet. Now, I just want to spend a few minutes because there's something interesting here. And I just want to spend a few minutes about the subject that has so many people interested for numerous reasons. And that is the Pakal Votan prophecy concerning the culmination of the age on December 21st, 2012 at 11, 11 p.m. There are a couple of developments that I, I want to bring to your attention but I just, I just need to quickly rehash, okay? Uh, basically, and what we've, been, we've been through this, but you'll see where I'm coming when, when we get to that point of the, of the uh, developments that are important for you and me. Uh, 
basically, Pakal Votan in 600 AD was, uh, a, a, you know, described as knowing this. This, this is what was said. Pakal Votan knew that humanity would become disconnected from the laws of the natural world and will fall ignorant of our sacred interdependence with nature. He foretold of our accelerated technological society and the resulting damage of our collective divergence from natural law in exchange for materialist value. In other words, what he said is you're going to get so consumed with your TVs, with your stocks, with your bonds, with your going to work, with all of this stuff, with your houses, with your mortgage, that you are going to totally lose all concepts of your interdependence with nature. You're going to take all the trees and you're going to knock them down so you can have more and more Walmarts, a Walmart on every block, and that's what you're going to do. And that's what we do. He knew. He knew about Walmart. Yeah, I think he said something about Walmart. <laughs> he did. Look what it says about Pakal Votan's prophecy speaks of the closing of this world age cycle on December 21st, 2012. Every prophecy you've ever heard, they say, this is going to happen, that's going to happen. Nobody ever said what? This guy said December 21st, 2012. As this date approaches, we are collectively in a transition phase of the old world dying and a new world being born. This is the most important sentence you should take out of here. Don't walk out of here in fear and watch these crazy people on television say about the end of the world. Absolutely not. It's the end of the old, hard, violent, bad ways and the birth of a new world beginning. Okay. Based on knowledge of the larger cycles of time as mapped by the ancient Maya Paka Volta knew that humanity as a species would become disconnected from the laws of the natural world and would fall ignorant of our sacred interdependence with nature. And he knew that modern humanity would be put to the test to see if we can regain our conscious connection to natural time as a universal frequency of synchronization evolving beyond the constructs of man-made time. What that means, in a real, real quick way, is there is no such thing as an hour, there is no such thing as a day, there is no such thing as a week. We made up all of those things so we could get old. I mean, there's no other explanation for it, but we have to have some way to keep track. You know, we couldn't just say, okay, uh, Bill's going to speak at the uh, hidden meanings thing. When? Well, you know, uh, uh, I don't know. So we had to make up something. So we'll say, well, it's 7 o'clock. It's not really 7 o'clock. Think of that. It's, it is not really any time. It just is. See? But we got ourselves to all glued. I'd say you're supposed to live 80 years, maybe 85, maybe 75, somewhere around that time, then you'll die. So we've got ourselves convinced, and everybody just, you know, they come out of here, and they just go right off the end of the thing. You know, it's like on a conveyor belt. Well, oh, 75, 80 years old, it's time up. Get rid of him. Got to retire. Got to... And nothing exists. We made it all up, just like this word. Made it all up. And he knew that. Okay. He knew that we didn't know about the uh, 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 astrology, uh, what astronomical things, and about the movement of the sun. He knew that. So we got ourselves all confused. Now, I'm not, when I saw this, I didn't get involved and say, "Well, <laughs> you know, this guy said so; it must be true." That's what you get in church, and I don't do that. I said, you know, wait a minute, I've been through all this religious stuff, prophecies and everything, and I don't pay much attention to them. But what we found, and, and this is all on DVDs, and I don't have time, you're not going to go through it again. Scientists in probing the time frame of the prophecy came up with this date of December 21st, 2012. With this particular context in mind, we are now prepared to examine more closely the reasons why the winter solstice in the year 2012 is so important. In the Mayan long count calendar, a cycle of 5,200 years ends on this date, and it just so happens it also points to a rare astronomical alignment. In fact, this alignment only happens once every 26,000 years. 
That's what got me involved. That's what got me interested because this guy in 600 AD was able to pinpoint December 20th, 21st, 2012 at 11, 11 p.m. And that is the exact second when something will happen that hasn't happened in 26,000 years. And, and we covered that, see? So this is, uh, we'll go on to the next one. With the auspicious year of 2012 indicated in the long count calendar illuminates the fact that the processional movement of the winter solstice sun will gradually bring its position into alignment with the very center of our galaxy. For the Maya, this is like the last stroke of midnight on New Year's Eve. Only in 2012, the new year is the new galactic year of 26,000 solar years. The galactic clock will be at zero point and a new procession will start. And that is 26,000 years since it's happened and Hopefully, you're going to be around to see it happen on December the 21st, 2012, at 11, 11. We should schedule a meditation for that. You know, at least hang out. <laughs> Anyhow, this is the culmination. Now, remember something. What he said was not that something's going to happen on December 21st, but that it's going to be completed on December the 21st. And that's what's going on, see? So I was looking, I said, oh, well, that's okay. It is. But I need some uh, scientific uh, proof. You know, scientific. What is it? Sci I need some scientific proof. So, okay, this is what we got. This comes from NASA. And scientists predict big solar cycle. Evidence is mounting. The next solar cycle is going to be a big one. Solar cycle 24 due to peak in 2010 or 2011 look like it's going to be one of the most intense cycles since record keeping began 400 years ago, says the Mike Marshall Space Flight Center and the American Geophysical. So I got the scientific documentation that I need. Between now and 2012, the solar cycle is going to be the strongest it's ever been since records were kept. That's significant because, once again, that's the Paco Vuitton date. So in the midst of this, when you're going to have this strongest solar cycle in 400 years, what else is going to happen? The sun is going to do a flip. Go ahead. Flip. You can't tell by looking, but scientists say the sun has just undergone an important change. Our star's magnetic field has flipped. The sun's magnetic poles will remain as they are now, with the North Pole pointing to the sun's southern hemisphere until the year 2012, when they will reverse again. 11 years sun. What's intriguing to me about this is that you're going to have the solar cycle, the strongest since records have been kept, and at that time, the sun is going to do a flip. So that's, you know, and, and, and all of these things have caused all kinds of thoughts. You can want the internet, and they've got everything from the Chinese coming across the border to atomic bombs to nuclear, and the overwhelming number of people haven't a clue that this is going on. You can go out on the street right here and start to say, what do you think about 2012? Many people are saying it's the end of the world and some of the apocalypse. And a lot of people have fear about it, and I guess it's justified because things are changing rapidly, and they have, and we're all looking day to day as to what's going to happen next. And we're in the middle of a tremendous change now with global warming and so forth. Financial institutions are collapsing, and, and all these things. And there was one other thing that's happening right now, and we talked about it, and that was the disappearance of the bees. Bees are disappearing. And, and why did this bring interest? Well, some people say he didn't say this, but this is Albert Einstein. If the bee disappeared off the surface of the globe, then man would only have four years of life left. No more bees, no more pollination, no more plants, no more animals, no more man. If the bees disappeared. But why should they? If we are going to start coming back into our interdependence and our sacredness with nature, the bees will return. Four years would bring us to around 2012, though, wouldn't it? But all of these things, which have delivered a message to 
everyone that things are happening on planet Earth, things are changing, basically is what this guy, Wotan, said would culminate in a new birth. See? And here's what's going to happen. And I'm proposing it to you. The violence and the need for profit at all costs would give way to a cleansing. The abuse of nature and animals and children would have to give way to a cleansing. Things have been happening over the past hundred years and it's a part of this great move to the time of change and cleansing. And I've asked you, I said, keep your eyes open every day for things that are startling that haven't happened before, that you think, maybe this is connected to what Paco Votan said. And so we watch the news and we see about the weather and global warming and the government and financial collapse and all that. But remember what Votan, what did he say? This is the time of a great cosmic correction, a time of cleansing, a time of healing, a time of a new birth, a time of healing, and I want to share with you two events that I'm proposing are part of Paco Votan's predictions because these things have never happened before. Daily pill halts Alzheimer's in its tracks. This is an unprecedented result in the treatment of Alzheimer's disease, said Professor Claude Wilshire, leader of a British research team. The results of the phase two study suggest that the new medication known as Rember stops Alzheimer's by as much as 81%. The findings are being hailed as the biggest breakthrough in the battle against Alzheimer's in over a century. As we go into the time of Pakal Votan and the new birth. We appear to be bringing the worst affected parts of the brain functionality back to life, said Dr. Claude Wyshek, who led the research. It is the first time medication has been developed to target the tangles in the brain that destroy nerve cells, leading to deteriorating memory. The drug helps to disrupt this process, preventing the formation of new tangles and loosening those already created. Last night, the findings were hailed as the biggest breakthrough in the battle against Alzheimer's since 1907. Eventually, the drug could be used to stop the disease in its early stages before symptoms have even appeared. Wow. Do you see what I'm saying? I mean, is it, is, go ahead, it's a coincidence. But are we really coming to the time of a new birth? Can you imagine in 2012 the culmination of the great change and the healing that will take place? I dare say there will be no such thing as Alzheimer's. And oh yes, the profiteers won't be happy. You know why? Because it is going to be a change on this earth. Healing is not going to be for sale. Healing is going to be for all. That is what God is about. That is what nature is about. And that is what the prophecy of Pakal Votan is about. But there's not a, that's not all. There's one other thing that happened. The time of the great healing, the great change, is becoming stronger and stronger as we move closer and closer to the date doctors may have found a way to destroy HIV. July 30th, 2008. Houston. There is real hope that what's happening in a Houston lab might lead to a cure for HIV, AIDS. We have found an innovative way to kill the virus by finding this small region of HIV that is unchangeable, Dr. Shudor Paul of the University of Texas Medical School at Houston said. Dr. Paul and Dr. Escobar aren't talking about just suppressing HIV, they're talking about destroying it permanently by arming the immune system with a new weapon lab tests have shown to be effective. Two things. Right now, just at the time of Paco Votan's prophecy of a new earth, a new creation, a new change, a rebirth, the healing of Alzheimer's and the healing of AIDS. Watch. 
the doctors are still needing funds to launch human trials. In the world of HIV research, that's often where things fall apart. Isn't that sick? No problem. How much money do you need to blow that apartment house to smithereens? Five billion? Sure. But these guys can't get the money. Clinical trials are very expensive, Paul said. The worry of the researchers is nightmares are made. <laughs> After 30 years of work, you find it doesn't work. But so far, it's working. And so this is what I think we should all be excited about, the old world, the dark ages, which we have lived through. It's more important to spend money on bombs than it is to spend to heal and make well. This is how we have destroyed and distorted God's word. But that is changing. And as we move closer and closer to the date of the great change, you'll see more and more of this. This is what Pakal Votan's prophecy means in the new birth. It's nothing to be frightened of. It's something to anticipate. Keep in mind, even change that heals and makes things right is bad for those who make a profit on things that are made wrong. But this is Pakavotan's prophecy again, and this is what you've got to keep in mind. The closing of this world age on December 21st, 2012. As this date approaches, we are collectively in a transition phase of the old world dying and a new world being born. And, and look what you just said. I don't know how many of you had saw those, uh, those headlines about Alzheimer's and AIDS. I mean, my God. They don't make the front page. What makes the front page is whether Barack Obama is a Muslim. I mean, you know, this is, this is the, the senility that the world we live in has gotten, and the reason is because of the, of the force of, of these monolithic groups of whether it be religion or corporations or governments who have just destroyed the thinking capacity of so many people. The new world will not be selling healing and it will be given freely. Don't bother your mind or try to rationalize how that works, but continue as an enlightened one to watch the work of the great light taking place on planet Earth. And as for Christians who cannot accept Paco Votan because he's not in the Bible, when he said, oh, these things are going to stop and we're going to have the old world dying and a new world being born, if they can't do all that Christian, then think of the Apostle Paul in the Bible and what did he say? Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Oh, there's the catch. Is that what are you, what are you talking about? You've got to be in Christ. I mean, I got to get converted. No. Watch what Christ said. What did he say? He said, at that time you will know I am in my Father, you and me, and I in you. The Christ is in you, and you enter into the Christ by entering into yourself. That's how easy it is. And then all things become new. And the Christ taught you without any question whatsoever. He taught you. Look, he said, seek first the kingdom. Look for it. Where is it? It's in you. How do I do it? Take no thought. Separate from the thoughts of the mind. Practice your single eye uh, getting the pineal gland. And then he says, you're taking away the key because you don't enter within yourself. So the question you have to ask yourself as we wrap this up, is will the great change come as an upsetment to you or as a great joy? Already you should be jumping with joy because the great change is Pakal Votan predicted. They're only less than four years from 2012 and they're on the verge of healing AIDS and, and Alzheimer's. Old things you've been used to are going to pass away. New things will come to planet Earth. And Scripture puts a great responsibility on you to change your mind. Allow the old mind to pass away and the new mind to live in you through the internal spiritual baptism. It says if you are in Christ, the old will pass away and you'll be part of the joy of the new. And Christ specifically tells you that the Christ mind is in you and you have your instructions as how to be part of it. Thank you for being with us, and we'll see you soon.